right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from actually an extremely wet and rainy San Diego. Unusual, but uh, nevertheless, we'll survive. And today I'm joined by Brandy McCarley, who is in Memphis, Tennessee. How are you doing, Brandy? I'm doing great. How are you doing, John? Excellent, excellent. And Brandy's a 16 year, 16 year um, sales veteran and entrepreneur, and she understands how stressful it can be to be a top producer. So she helps CEOs scale by creating diverse people centric organizations. And what we're going to talk about today is how to use data to build a rock star sales team. And this is something very close to our hearts on the pipeline or CRM side, because we are uh, spending a lot of time right now and bringing features, new features to market that's all around data and, and analytics for sales. So let's get straight into it, uh, Brandy. Um, so you hear a lot about big data and there's tons of data and you could spend your whole day collecting data on everything, but you have to, I guess the starting point is you have to figure out what data is really relevant for, for your sales team before you can turn them into a, into a rock star team. Absolutely. You need to identify what type of salespeople you are looking for first before you can, you know, build a rock star team because the people that are actually going to be doing the selling depend upon whether they are going to be outside salespeople or inside salespeople. So they have different personality traits and we can identify those personality traits and determine the likelihood of success in a particular role, but it is important to identify what those traits are that you need in the role first. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And so um, when you're doing this and you're building these, uh, helping people build these teams, what are some of the significant different traits between the two types, like between an actor and, and a direct sales person, maybe an in inside sales person? Well, I think um, one of the most important traits between an outside salesperson and inside salesperson is their ability to create relationships. So someone that is an outside salesperson, you know, they really need to have the ability to be able to go out and create relationships with people. Whereas someone that's an inside salesperson, they need to be able to build quick rapport, but mostly that rapport uh, that they establish with their clients or customers will most likely be based on product knowledge. So those are kind of two different areas, you know, someone may have a high sociability where they are really extroverted and they can go out and talk to anyone. And then someone else may have a trait where they're very knowledge driven. So that person is someone that's going to be better for inside sales because they're going to be able to rely on their product knowledge to sell the product. Mm -hmm. And how much given, given the fact that a lot more people have been selling virtually and probably will continue to as a, uh, even even after things open up a bit, because I think a lot of companies have seen the value of, of doing it that way and the cost savings involved. What what impact has that had on direct salespeople? As you say, the type that you're talking about, who normally is great at going out and meeting people and may, may have to do a lot of this virtually. Well, I think direct salespeople have had to give it a lot. Um, I know for me, you know, I've been in direct sales for 16 years and it's kind of challenging because uh, someone like me who's used to being on the go, used to being mm -hmm. out in the field, you know, going from one place to another, you know, I've had to take a step back and figure out how to um, sit down. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm used to being on the go and I, I'm, it's hard for me to sit still, but I've had to sit down and figure out how to, you know, be still and um, pivot to Zoom meetings and virtual calls and things like that. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's a major shift for someone like me that's used to being in the field. Yeah, and I guess in some ways it's actually allowed... Uh it's given the the people who are already doing that kind of work on the inside, it's probably given them, um, you know, they've had a, they've kind of had a, a leg up on everybody. Well, some of those people have had to pivot too, because it's like now, you know, nobody wants to get on a phone call anymore. Everybody wants to do a Zoom call or a video mm -hmm. call. And I'm like, can we just talk on the phone? You know, <laughs> but, but uh, everything is gone virtual. You have virtual networking, 
and you have virtual Zoom calls for just about everything. People are setting um, coffee meetings. Uh, people mm -hmm. are having, you know, after work sets with drinks. So everything is gone virtually. So even those people that have been accustomed to selling maybe over the phone, now they're even scheduling virtual meetings. Mm -hmm. So what are some other um, pieces of data that uh, you uh, you analyze in, in when you're trying to build a, a high performing team? Well, the assessment that I use, we measure people based on seven work related traits. And so one of those traits is autonomy. And that's basically mm -hmm. your inner directed self ego, uh, whether this person is kind of what you would call a natural born leader or if they're more of a team player. We measure based on sociability and social ability, uh, someone with a high social ability that's going to be that person that's able to go out there and really build those relationships or someone with a low social ability. Not that high and low means anything negative or positive. It's just sure. um, on the bell curve. But someone with a low social ability, they prefer, prefer to work with technical issues as opposed to working with people. We measure pace. So we measure whether someone has a high sense of urgency or whether they work more in a methodical order and you know plan their work in a sequential mm -hmm. order. We also, also measure conformity. So we're measuring if someone has a tendency to break the rules or if they're going to, <laughs> if they're going which, to really... <laughs> which is practically every salesperson who ever lived, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, what do they say? Uh, ask for permission later. <laughs> it's better to um, ask for forgiveness than permission. Mm -hmm. um, so then another thing that we measure is mental stamina. And that's basically whether someone has a behavioral flexibility, if they're going, if they're working outside of their wheelhouse, is this person going to need to take a lot of breaks or can they work for an extended period of time? We also measure logic and that's that person's ability, whether they make emotional decisions or if they make decisions based on facts or data. And then we also measure ingenuity and that's where we're measuring the abstract of thought. Does this person have really creative ideas? Are they really future focused, you know, with these abstract ideas like an Elon Musk or Walt Disney, or are their ideas more practical in nature? And so what we do when we assess someone, we take those traits, the way that they're hardwired, and we compare them to the way that they think that they should behave in order to be successful in their current role. So have you seen over the last while, have you seen any of these uh, traits become more or less important? Because I would um, I would have said that the flexibility part is probably extremely important now, given the fact that you know people have had to, as you said, pivot and change. But also the, the future is a little bit uncertain. Who knows where things are going to go? So your ability to to be flexible and to roll with things is obviously quite critical. Absolutely. And of course, um, when we compare the behavioral traits, the, that is a snapshot in time. So that can always change as far as, you know, um, different projects that a person may be working on or something that may be going on personal in their life. But the survey traits, the personal traits, the way that they, that they are hardwired, that's not going to change because people develop their personality traits. Um, the research shows at least by the age of 12, but there is research that demonstrates that people develop their personality traits as early as preschool. So we're talking like three or four years old. And, and if you have children or if you've been around children, you know, you probably have, have seen that before. But when you compare that to the behavioral of how someone thinks that they should perform in order to be successful in a role, you will see some changes depending upon the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, it's it, it, it's fascinating. It's fascinating. And and have you found that more and more companies are starting to look to do uh, these assessments and work with people like you? Because, I mean, let's face it, whenever I talk to uh, business leaders or, or anybody else, you know, who's in a senior position in, in, in a company, um, the, the conversation always gets around to say, recruiting salespeople. And it's still everybody still says the same thing. It's really hard to find good salespeople. It's really hard to recruit salespeople and the turnover is still very high. So are you seeing some changes? Some people may be starting to look at things like what you're doing a little bit more because it is still probably the toughest hire to make. 
Absolutely. Um, data analytics is the wave of the future, is the workforce of the future. And most companies are looking to integrate data analytics into every phase of their company, including the hiring process, especially when you have a tool like mine that gives you a very high probability of success in a particular role. Our assessment, it does have a 0.9% validity rating, and it is not certified, but it is um, it is not approved. <laughs> That's not the word I'm looking for. It is, uh, what is the word? I'm looking for a word. It, it meets the standards of the okay, EEOC yeah. for hiring. Yeah, so okay. it, it, is, it, it does meet the standard of EEOC for hiring. So it does have a 0.9% validity rating and it has the highest validity rating of any other assessment on the market that may be similar to ours because there's not one that's like ours. <laughs> <laughs> and and when, when, you work, when you work with companies and they do the assessment, are they ever surprised? Because sometimes uh, I guess people will you know, they'll, they'll already have gone through rounds of, of interviewing or, or advertising or stuff. And then sometimes at the last minute, they think, oh, maybe we should do some kind of assessment. Um, when you work with people like that, are they ever surprised that the results that come out of the assessment compared to their perceptions of the candidates? Well, actually, the way that we work with people, our assessment is integrated into the hiring process. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we benchmark the traits that we're looking for in a particular role. And when an applicant applies to that role, there is a percentile rank. So we rank applicants based upon how closely they are matched to the traits that the company is looking for in a particular role. Um, I would say your question would probably be more leaning towards when you do an initial assessment for a company. And um, because we do provide non-biased free assessments right. to companies where we assess people's teams for them. And a lot of times I won't say that the leadership is surprised by what they see. Um, they may just not understand the reason why someone isn't performing the way that they should be. Um, so then we are able to provide the information for them. But nine times out of 10, you know, when I'm talking with someone, I always ask them, how is this person performing for you on a scale of one to 10? So, you know, if they're performing anything less than a six, then we already know that that person's not doing really well. So they have an idea that they're not doing well. They just may not know the reason why. So then that's where I come in and I can show them, but this is the reason why this person is not doing well in this role because they're just not a good candidate. They're not hardwired. This is not in their wheelhouse. Yeah, so that's because that's really fascinating. Um, so, um, how often do when you're doing these these kind of interventions? How often are you discovering that people are are really in the wrong job? I mean, they're in as we said at the beginning. There's different types of sales roles, but how often do you discover that people are actually put in the wrong roles? Well, especially in a sales role. Um, I mean, I think. It, it just depends um, there, most oftentimes than not, because um, in a sales role, especially if it's an outside sales role, you really need someone that has that autonomy that wants to um, have freedom in their work and that they can really take ownership in that work. Someone that, you know, has vision and they are able to make strategic plans. And so those type of people, uh, what we would consider a high A, those type of people, they really don't like people telling them what to do. And so <laughs> they're mm -hmm. able to they're able to work, you know, unsupervised on their own. Whereas someone who is a low A, they need a lot of clear direction. So depending upon, you know, if that is a outside sales role, you wouldn't necessarily want to put someone in that role that needs a lot of direction because you know, the person that's an outside sales person, they really need to be able to take ownership for themselves and they have to be able to make decisions on their own because they're out in the field alone. They're not there with their manager. So they can't just look to their manager for direction or ask questions. You know, of course the manager may always be available, but then, mm -hmm. you know, the outside sales rep, you know, if, if they may have to call the manager and maybe the manager's in a meeting or they may have to send an email. So you really need someone that really has the ability to make a decision, you know, without their leadership guiding their decisions all the time. 
And, and can you give me just an example? You don't have to name the company or anything, but just give me a kind of an anecdotal example of, of where you did this with <clears throat> where you did this with the company and, and what the results were before and after. Well, the, um, <laughs> the results for most of the companies that I work with is that the leadership is working smarter, not harder. And mm -hmm. so uh, a lot of CEOs of the companies that we work with, they tell us that, hey, you know, I went from working 60 to 80 hours a week to working 20 hours a week. I don't have anything to do because we built such a great team um, around them and we really empower people to be able to make their own decisions and do the work that needs to be done. So now the CEO doesn't need to have anything to do. He can go off and play golf or start another company if he wants to. I want that job. <laughs> so, yeah, let me know where that's available. <laughs> um, listen, uh, Brandy, this has been fantastic. So um, all of Brandy's information will be below this video. But before we go, Brandy, please tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. A little bit more about myself and what I do. Well, my name is Brandy McCarley, and I am an executive advisor with Culture Index. And what I do is I provide data to CEOs to help them clarify their team culture dynamics and make sure that they put the right person in the right role. The way that I do that is with an assessment. It's a free choice assessment where an individual will go through and they will choose between 174 words that they personally identify with. It's a little bit different from a lot of other assessments because most assessments are forced choice assessments where you may have four choices. You may not really identify with either of them, but you're forced to make a choice. So how accurate is that assessment really able to get their data if they're forcing people to choose something where our assessment is a free choice. So you choose the adjectives that you think best describe you. And with that, we're, we measure people based on seven work-related traits, and we're able to identify what are the best ro roles that people are best suited for. Going yeah. forward, we, we, Go integrate, we integrate that into the hiring process for companies where we use the C job to create benchmarks for particular roles, and we use the C filter to create a percentile rank and demonstrate how close of a percentage match each individual is to the particular traits the company is looking for. Yeah, listen, that fantastic. Uh, and, uh, and, and I would totally encourage people to, to check it out uh, because listen, we live in a time when, I mean, data, data is critical in making, in helping us make decisions. We can't afford to make hiring mistakes. Um, both for ourselves and for the individuals concerned, it it it, it um, you know it, it's it's it really serves everybody that if if it's done properly so that the right person gets the job, you hire the right person, everybody's happy. So I would uh, encourage people to check out the Culture Index and to check out Brandy's work. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you.